Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome our, our fellow honorary rangers um, across South Africa to this very interesting uh, webinar uh, presented to us by uh, Professor Tony Rubello. Uh, Prof Rubello grew up in Cape Town uh, and he obtained his PhD degree at the University of Cape Town. He has published widely. I can remember my very first South types of uh, uh, South Africa, Lesotho, and Swaziland uh, that I bought was actually uh, written by Lone Rebello. Uh, and when I bought it, I never would have thought that I would have the privilege to listen to uh, Tony live and, and to, uh, to meet him in person. But be that as it may, um, he has published uh, also uh, many publications on, uh, on pollination ecology, also on conservation planning. As a matter of fact, he was one of the pioneers of designing uh, efficient conservation networks um, in South Africa. He also spearheaded uh, the Protea Atlas project. And those of you that are involved with that will know it is a citizen science initiative that mapped Southern Africa's uh, proteas uh, in, an unprecedented, uh, in unprecedented detail. And uh, I was told that uh, all the information that I gathered uh, from, from citizens is morphed into the Sandby, uh, Sandby's very successful custodian of rare and endangered wildflower team and, and website. And Tony, uh, like I said, spearheaded, spearheaded that. He, uh, more recently, um, he is involved with uh, the citizen science program uh, called iNaturalist, uh, a very interesting program. And those of you that haven't contributed to that, you can, you can maybe Tony can, can share towards the end of his talk, share a bit uh, about iNaturalist with us. Uh, he's also been involved in the International City uh, Nature Challenge, where everyone can participate in recording plants and animals uh, in our cities. And Cape Town uh, has come out tops of all the cities in the world for the last two years already. So very proud, like I said, uh, he's very much involved in that as well. Tony's current focus uh, is in restoration ecology, and he specifically focuses on saving the Cape Flat sand fungus in the Tukai section of the Taiba Mountain National Park. And it is a collaborative uh, project between Kustomos National Botanical Gardens, uh, the Millennium Seed Bank, sand parks, and, and volunteers. Tony is currently involved with uh, SANDI, the South African National uh, Biodiversity Institute. And he received, uh, two years ago, he received the international award. He was awarded the International Society of Ecological Restorations Regional Award in 2019. Uh, uh, a, a great achievement uh, as far as I'm concerned. So where will you find Tony? First of all, um, we are privileged to, to have Tony on board as an army ranger as well. He uh, serves as an active SHR member of the Table Mountain region since 2008. And if you're looking for him, he's somewhere hacking invasive species or hiking in the mountain, uh, those are hobbies. I would like to welcome you, Tony, and, and thank you very much for giving up your time and share with us the very interesting and controversial topic of fires and fungus, the complexities of it, uh, the conundrums of it, and we are really looking forward uh, to listen to you, uh, Tony. I would like to invite um, our participants to pose your questions in the Q&A uh, section, and we will then deal with that towards the end of Tony's talk. Welcome, Tony. Uh, we anxiously await your presentation. Thank you very much, Willie. Um, let me get my share, is my screen going? Mm. 
Can we see that? Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking on um, pain, boss, and fire. Um, and before I do, I would just like to recommend that those of you who missed Natasha Governor's talk on fire and Kruger, um, that perhaps you should go and have a look at it. It was a very interesting talk. I'll give the link at the end. And then your homework for this um, weekend is to see William Bond's video on trees and grass. It's really fun, worthwhile. Um, and I, I see them as background to the talk I'll be giving. Okay, now I was hoping to talk on Fane and Fire, um, a manager's nightmare, um, but the organizers were a bit too worried I'd get um, the park manager and the fire manager in Table Mountain upset um, because I do tend to be controversial. And so I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on the plants um, and a little bit less on the management implications and problems. And um, so there's a ghost talk behind this talk I'm going to give, and I hope I don't stray too much from this talk. Okay, well now we've been seeing in the news, um, fires are in the news for the last three years. Um, the headlines are getting more and more spectacular. The fires are catastrophic. Um, and here we have one um, from Europe, and it started off in Portugal and then France, it's been in Italy, and the latest in the news is Greece. Um, and at the same time, we're having fires in Australia, um, in Sydney, Perth. Um, California has been having fires for the last three, four years, spectacular fires, um, really eye-catching stuff. And Algeria, Tunisia is currently in the news um, with its fires. So around the world, we're having fires, and those are all the Mediterranean regions, but the fires aren't confined to the Mediterranean regions. So Canada is now coming into the fires as well. And Russia is battling with catastrophic fires. Um, and it's due to, it says, due to lack of fire defense funding. Okay, we all know the fires from Cape Town. We've all been and seen them. 2000 was our big fire on the Cape Peninsula. And then exactly 15 years later, which is the average fire interval, we had the 2015 fire. And I can confidently invite you to the 2030 fire um, and hopefully we'll be prepared for it and we'll be able to sit back and watch the spectacle um, as it unfolds. And it might be a bit out, it might be 2029 or it might be 2030, um, but as sure as you've got a nose on the end of your face, there's going to be another fire in 15 years time. Um, and then in 2017, we had the great Neisner fires and it's quite interesting to look at the news headlines. We're now talking about perfect infernos and perfect storms. Um, and the whole of the garden route was burning down. And that's an interesting fire because it started here as a lightning strike, according to one of the theories. It started as a lightning fire and the teams who went to go and put it out couldn't find it. They couldn't get to it um, and they couldn't figure out where it was. And then after about a week, overnight, it exploded. And then within a couple of hours, um, two houses were down, a family was dead, and then it roared across um, the area towards Neisner, but it wasn't the only fire. Under those conditions, a few other fires, at least two other fires broke out simultaneously. And then more recently, we've just had our Easter fire on Devil's Peak. Um, it might have been started by vagrants and it burnt um, towards UCT, um, spectacular fire. Um, and just some pictures from UCT News. Um, look at that tree. It's all on its own. There's no fire around it. It just decided to burn on its own. Some species carry fire. Some species are dangerous. And these are not the plants you want to have around your university or your house. Um, UCT should not have been unprepared because the botany department had produced a report about five years ago saying that the alien plants were bad um, and they needed controlling. And unfortunately, the botany department suffered the brunt of it of some of the fires, a palm tree, not this one, one behind it caught fire and it put embers onto the roof and set fire to the IPC. Or well, for those of you older, that was the old Percy Fitzpatrick Institute. That's where I got my PhD. Um, and that burnt down in the fire. So that was a devastating fire. It's been our most recent fire. And if you want to just go see why it was so devastating, there is a opinion piece produced by Alana and Karen from Stellenbosch University at the Friends of the Kai Park website. And you can read that if you want just a quick synopsis of what I'm going to be talking about for the first half of my talk. 
Okay, what do we need for a fire? Well, it's quite simple. We need three things. We need an ignition, we need some oxygen, and we need some fuel. The ignition can come from lightning or rock falls, um, but most fires are now caused by people. They have for the past 100,000 years. So people fires are part of Fainbos. Um, yes, there's more people around now, but people have been part of the problem, well, not the problem, part of the fa of fire in Fainbos for as long as Fainbos um, has been recorded. And then there's infrastructure as well. So things like um, electric power lines, electric lines, when they fall down, they start fires as well. So these are the causes of fire. But for fire to happen, we need oxygen. Now, the Earth's oxygen is a constant at 21%. And it's been like that fairly, for a fairly long time. In the Devonian, it got up to 30%. Um, and that's when we had the dragonflies as big as people, two meters across the wingspans. Um, and under the conditions of 30 degrees, all you have to do is bang two sticks together and you've got a fire. So fortunately, we're not living under high oxygen levels anymore, but we do have weather such as temperature, humidity and wind, which bring oxygen to the fire and get the fire to burn. Temperature, we have a Q10 of two, which means that for every 10 degrees, the fire will burn twice as fiercely. So in a cold, I felt winter, if the fire goes at 10 degrees, It'll burn with a certain ferocity. Um, but if the fire was 20 degrees, it would burn twice as fiercely. In 30 degrees, it would burn four times as fiercely. In 40 degrees, it would be eight times as fiercely. And if the temperature gets up into the high 40s, near 50s, we're talking about six, 16 times as fierce as it would on a cold, high felt morning. So the temperature is crucial for the actual ferocity of the fire and how bad it is. But temperature is not nearly as important as humidity. Um, the humidity is actually what drives the fire, fire weather. Um, and we see that um, if we look at the most of South Africa, which gets summer rain, it's hot, it's wet, the plants grow like mad. They absolutely love it. Um, hot, wet is ideal for plant growth. Um, and then we have the cold, dry winters, and that's when we have the fire season with the cold, dry winters. So um, in the high felt, in the low felt, your fires are going to be in winter. But that's not the case in the Cape. In the Cape, we have cold, wet winters. So the plants try and grow, and they do okay. They do fantastically under the situation. But then summer comes along, and it's hot and dry, and they can't grow. There's no water. There's nothing they can do. They just have to go into dormancy um, and wait for the rains to come again. But that's ideal weather for fires. That's exactly what fires want. Nice, hot, dry, and they take off and um, it's ideal for them. And that's, no, that's the reason um, why it's no surprise that the Mediterranean regions of the world have some of the most spectacular fires and that we are recording, seeing in the newspapers. And then of course, the last thing we need is fuel. The fuel is perhaps one of the most important things because if there's no fuel, it's not gonna burn. Um, and the fuel is determined by the vegetation type. So your grass felt with the fine grasses, that's gonna burn much more easy than the fainbos, which is slightly more shrubby. And your forests are going to have a hard time burning. They will burn, um, but much harder time burning because they've got thick branches um, which don't burn so well. And then felt age is important. The younger the felt, the less fuel there is. The older the felt, the more fuel. So as we allow the felt to age, so the fuel accumulates and we can get better fires, bigger fires. And then there's some plant strategies. I showed you that plant that wanted to burn. Um, some plants promote fire. And if you've got lots of them in your environment, you're going to have more fires. And then alien plants. Alien plants tend to come from other regions which are prone to fire. So they fire adapted as well, but they don't have any of their pests here. So they grow faster, they grow bigger, they produce more fuel, they produce more biomass faster. And as a consequence, they create a higher fuel load um, and they burn much better um, and hotter. And then lastly, um, a way of accumulating fuel is to exclude fire. Okay, so now we're faced with the manager. We've got this problem. We know that there's fires. How do we solve it? Well, the obvious solution is to go for the ignition. Let's stop the fires. If we stop the fires, then we've got no problem. We just, there's no fires. End of, end of problem. Um, and so we can throw some resources at it. Um, people, manpower, equipment, money, and we can stop the fires. But as we stop the fires, the vegetation gets older and the plants continue growing and the fuel increases. But that's easily solved. 
we throw some more money at it. We throw more resources at it. We put more people in and we control the fires. And of course, the fuel increases. You can see where this is going. No matter how much money you put in, no matter how much resources you put in, no matter what you try and do, your fuel will increase until one day the weather will contrive to create a, fire, a situation where you won't be able to put out the fire. And then you are going to have a catastrophic fire. And how catastrophic will depend on how much money you spent and how much resources you've got and how many firefighters you have um, and what the equipment is that you're using to control the fire. And the big catastrophic fires that we're seeing now aren't due to the weather, don't blame the weather. It's due to the fact that people, firefighters, managers, are putting out the fires um, instead of letting them burn. So under these conditions, a day will happen when it'll be hot and humid and windy enough, and the fuel that's been accumulated will burn and we'll have a problem. Now we humans, we concentrate on the ignition. We need to concentrate on the ignition because we want to blame someone. So if there's a fire, and we need to get money. And to get money, we have to say, we put out 3,000 fires on the Cape Peninsula last year. Um, so we need more money. Um, and then if something burns down or there's a problem, we need to find someone that we can sue um, and get them to cover the costs. So the emphasis um, on managers, on stuff, is actually on the ignition event and, and what is happening around the fire. From the ecology point of view, the ignition is irrelevant. If we have our little patch of bus over here, Almost all the fires are going to start somewhere else. It might be a kilometer away or 10 kilometers away or 400 kilometers away. And the fire is going to move through our, into our patch, burn us down, and then move out of our patch and continue off in the other direction. So from the patch of Fainbos here on Table Mountain, um, how the fire started and where it started is irrelevant. All that that patch needs to know is that it's going to burn every 15 years, and then it's got to adapt to the fact that it's going to be burning every 15 years. So the Feinbus doesn't worry about ignition at all. It's all about the fuel load, and it's the fuel load that determines the fire return interval if you don't do anything. And if you want to manage fires, the clever way is to manage the fuel and to not ignore the ignition, but to not place so much emphasis on stopping ignition. If you keep the fuel levels low, then you can keep the fire under management and a manageable um, level. Um, so what we really want is a situation like this, where you come along and you get your equipment ready and you get your teams ready and you put in your fire belts. And when you're ready with the right weather conditions, the right wind, the right temperature, the right humidity, you light the fire and you start this fire. Okay, some people call this a controlled fire. There's no such thing. The moment you light it, it's out of control. So I prefer the term prescribed burn. Um, and then some people use a fuel reduction burn. Um, if it's a fuel reduction burn, it means you've done something wrong. Um, you want to work with the ecology. You want to work with nature. You want to use fire to fight fire. Um, and this is the sort of situation you as a manager want to be dealing with. Whereas if you keep on putting out fire, fire will choose the conditions. And you'll end up with a situation where you have high fuel loads. Impossible weather conditions with high temperature and high winds. Half your team has got to scramble to get there. The other half of your firefighting team has got to go there to evacuate the people you need to get move out of the area because their houses are going to burn down. Um, the other half of your team is running to get backwards because the fire has jumped over their heads and then they now need to regroup behind. Whereas a portion of your team is desperately trying to run and survive because the fire is about to overwhelm them and perhaps kill them. Um, these are not the conditions you want to be fighting a fire. And if you are going to play the game of stopping igni ignition, these are the conditions that are going to happen because sooner or later, the weather will contrive to overwhelm you and take over the situation. And this is not where we want to be. This is not a healthy situation. Okay, I just want to go and do a little bit of history and just how did we get here. Um, and this is just my garden. You can see here it was a lovely stage at this stage. Um, and as it grew older, it needed a fire, but my wife wouldn't allow me to burn. So I'm still upset that I wasn't allowed to burn my garden. Um, but yeah, it's coming away again. Okay, so let's just go back. 1400s, the Portuguese sailing past recorded that there were great fires inland around the Plittenberg Bay area. 
um, but they never landed, they just went on. In Van Riebeck, if you read his diaries, he talks about looking out over what is now the city bowl and seeing the koi fires, the cooking fires at night, dotting the whole landscape. And the koi used fire extensively. Um, when they moved in with their cattle, they would graze, and when they were finished, they set fire to the felt, and then they migrated on, and then they came back a year or two later um, and grazed again. So they used fire as the tool for grazing. Um, and they used it for more than that. So one of the expeditions, one of San Francisco's expeditions up country, um, the guys discovered that there was no fuel for their vehicles. They were driving by ox wagon with oxes, and they came and the felt was burnt. And there was warfare between two Koi tribes. And what the Koi did was simply burnt the other tribe out by burning before the grazing season. And then there was no food and the other tribe had to either move or because the cattle were wealth and they had to become hunter gatherers um, and lost their power and status in the community. So um, fire was used more than just for refreshing the felt. It was also used for war. And then in the 1700s, we had the note that Renosta felt changed. Now, we don't know why it changed. It could have been because we were coming out of the Little Ice Age. Remember, Van Riebeck landed in the middle of the Little Ice Age um, and things were warming up, global warming. Um, but Renosta felt changed from a grassland to a shrubland. And the current theory is that what had happened was um, that the koi would graze and then burn and then move off and allow the felt to recover and then come back the next year. Whereas your settlers stayed put in one spot and they lit the fire, burnt the felt, rejuvenated the grass, but then grazed it straight away. And that grazing eliminated the grasses. And so Renosta felt changed from the grass into the shrub. And then there was the great fire of 1869. In 1869, at sunrise on Tuesday, the 9th of February, 1969, we had a berg wind. A berg wind is a catabatic wind. Those of you in the Cape know it. It comes before every cold front. Um, and it's due to air coming off the plateau. And as it lowers, as it goes down off the plateau, it warms up and dries up. So it's a hot, dry wind. Um, and so it's got all the elements you want for fire. Hot, dry, windy. Perfect. And this was the hottest Berg wind in living memory. This intensely hot hurricane raged through an area from Riversdale to Utenaig and even as far as Port Elizabeth. And fires broke out across a distance of over 450 kilometers, and it seemed like the world went up in flames. So a third of the Western Cape province burnt down in one fire over a couple of days. Okay, now that's a spectacular fire. Reports from the different places say that all the fires started early on Tuesday morning, and this suggests that it couldn't have been a single fire, but lots of fires spreading from west to east in forest, rainbows, and farms. Um, and of course, this is the situation with weather climate, fire climate. Um, you don't just get one fire when the weather conditions are bad, you get many. Um, and this spread from the mountains towards the coast, all driven by the berg wind, which blows from north or northwest. So a third of the province burnt down in this catastrophic fire. And we thought that the Devil's Peak fire was bad. Um, and interestingly, as we come into the 20th century, the first Cape botanists at the college and the UCT were all anti-fire. So Harry Bowles in 1908 writes, in dealing with the Cape plants, the rarity of some of these is doubtless due to the frequent bushfires. I believe hundreds of species have become extinct from this cause during the last century. Um, and that's weird coming from this guy because he was an orchid specialist. Most of these species flower in the year after fire. And yet he had this view that fires were bad. Rudolf Marlos who's probably the greatest naturalist we've had in South Africa so far. Um, he wrote, whole hill slopes being sometimes covered with Watsonia and other tall flower spikes, which is spectacular. It's a sad spectacle. And it realizes the tremendous slaughter that has taken place to produce this display. So to get pretty flowers, we need a massive slaughter. And that's sad. Robert Adamson, who wrote Adamson and Salt on the floor of the um, Cape Peninsula, um, he records, by far the most effective agent of change has been the frequent burning of the vegetation, resulting in the retrogression of the normal succession 
and an impoverishment of the flora. So we're losing stuff because of these fires. And even John Aycox, who did the um, vegetation types of Africa, he recorded half of the fainbos as false machia, which was derived from natural forest or grassland by burning, overgrazing, and clearing. So he categorized half of our fainbos as being degenerate. Now, how on earth could these guys have had this viewpoint? I mean, these are our top scientists at the turn of the last century, and they are anti-fire. Um, and at this stage, I'm going to move on to the plants. If you want to read up more about this and find out more about this, I can highly recommend Simon Pooley's book on Burning Table Mountain. Um, it's a good read, get hold of it, um, and you can go and explore the further history um, over there. So why were these guys so wrong? And part of the reason was because of John Buse. Now, Buse was one of the international botanists. He worked in South Africa, um, but he was one of the people who was instrumental in the whole finding of ecology as we understand it. And he adopted the Clemensian succession idea, which basically said that if you had a disturbance, some plants came in and they colonized the disturbed area and they produced more nitrogen and they produced more carbon and they improved the soil. And by improving the environment, they made the felt suitable for other species to come in which also improved the environment and made it better with more nutrients and more thing and so on and so on and so on until we came to a climax community, which was a lovely tree community where the soils were highly productive, the biodiversity was high and everything was happening. And it was this climax community, which was the one that we would get most benefit from um, and that the environment was striving towards. And this applied in terms of numbers and cover. So the numbers of plants, um, increased and decreased, and the cover of them increased and decreased as the succession moved along through time towards this climax community. Now, how on earth could our botanists, who were keen observers and knew their plants backwards, how could they have adopted this when it's so wrong? Um, this works fine in Europe, but not over here. And part of the problem is that if we look at Fainbos, it has the same appearance. If you go and walk in it, the cover shows the same patterns. We start off with our bulbs and our Watsonias and our spectacular displays, which are a sad reminder of the destruction that had to take place in the fire. Um, and then we move to the Restios and the Ericas and the Proteas as the felt gets older through time. So we do have that same succession there, but that is not the story, the complete story. And that's where they missed out um, by having this European paradigm. So after a fire, the Resprouters recover first, you can see some of them flower straight away within a year or two, within a year, within six months of the fire. And a King Protea, our national flower, that's one of the re-sprouters that re sprouts off the fire. Um, and they grow fast um, and recover very quickly. Then come in the bulbs, our spectacular orchids, some of which only flower in the year after fire, and the other species that come in and flower and set seed. And interestingly, a lot of them produce seed which are recalcitrant, that means they cannot be stored. So those seeds have to germinate and they have to grow in this new environment and post fire. And they of course will grow slowly. So they won't flower until the next fire. And these plants will also, um, having flowered and set seed, they will then disappear and you'll only see them um, in the next fire in 15 years time. And then we have these mass bulb displays there. We can see them. Notice in between, there's not enough fuel yet to carry a fire but we've got beautiful displays um, that we'll only see um, post-fire in that disturbed and desecrated environment um, that Rupert Marloff told us about. And then the rest here, we start growing up and start dominating. And it's at this stage when the rest years are dominating at about three to four years after the fire that Fainbus can again carry a fire. There's now enough fuel for it to burn. Um, and if a fire does start under ideal weather conditions, um, it will burn. Um, and as the felt matures, so our other species start coming through, our daisies and our ericas, and we go through to the ericoid fainbos phase where the ericas are dominating the landscape um, and the rest years are now being overwhelmed by other species. And the succession continues. Um, oh, let's just um, deal with the ericas quickly. Ericas have a wide variety of um, strategies. It's our biggest genus. 
And we have species like Erica coccinia, which is killed by fire, species like Erica mimosa and Erica serenthoides, the fire heath that flower after the fire and recoppers from their rootstocks. And then we've got species like Erica siciliflora, which stores the seeds, shown there, that's the seed pod. It's storing the seeds, it's waiting for the fire. And when the fire comes, it will release the seeds. And then we've got fire, um, fire avoiders, like the gooseberry heath. And it occurs in rocky outcrops where it's relatively protected from fires and where it can grow to two, three times the fire cycle um, and survive the fires. And Erica patersonia, which is a fire weed, it grows like mad after a fire. It produces its seeds at two to three years and by five years it's gone. You won't see it again until you come back from the next fire. So within the genus, we have a full range of all the strategies for surviving fire and maintaining fire. And then we have our fire weeds. I've given you examples here from Proteus. These are two of the species which we are going to be looking at in a little bit more detail in a little while. And um, these are the ones which fly quickly, set seed and die. And then we go into the mature fainbos phases. These are the Proteus. They dominate, they come into the overstory, they take over the felt and shade out the other resprouters and stuff and grow on um, to become the overstory. Um, and at this stage, the fainbos is ready to burn. Um, and there's just some elements of our Proteus, a whole a wide variety of species um, that make up the fainbos. Now, fainbos must burn. How do we know this? How do we know that Fainbos must burn? Well, the story starts, if you like, and um, with Mari Fox being called in because Forestry has having a problem with the Blushing Bride. Um, forestry was looking after the water catchments. Blushing Bride had made headlines because it was had been rediscovered and was growing in Kirstenbosch, and the plants were doing fantastically in Kirstenbosch, but in the wild, they were all dying out and they were getting less and less. So the forestry called in Mari Fox, who was busy doing her PhD on the King Protea, and they asked her for advice, and they came here and they did all the usual things, fencing it, keeping out pickers from picking the flowers, um, and looking after the felt, and it made no difference. Plants got less and less, um, and was just down to a handful of plants. And then a fire came through, and there were thousands, but the time wasn't right. The penny didn't drop. Nobody realized at this stage that this was a fireweed and that it needed fire. Ten years later, in the 1970s, um, the same situation arose with the marsh rose. This is the marsh rose growing in Kuchelberg, forestry looking after it, and they had the same issues. They were dying out. Now, I think to appreciate this plant, you need to know that at about 10, 15 years old, most of the plants are dead, but the survivors are standing three, four meters tall. You don't look at a marsh rose, you look up to it. Um, and it's absolutely spectacular. And Charlie Boucher came and he looked at the problem and um, they tackled it the same way they always did. They fenced it off, they kept out the pickers, they put security guards on to look at it, they looked after it, made sure it wasn't disturbed, and they got less and less and less. And then on June 1979, they were down to the last plant. The species was on the verge of extinction. And there we can see the fences to fence of the population. And notice that this plant is in the fence line. It came up when they scuffled the fence line. All the plants inside are already dead. So the last plant was one of the ones that came up because of the disturbance. And that was it. It was recorded for posterity. Um, and then in January the next year, a major fire came through. And of the six known populations, all of them recovered. And we had 3,000 plants growing, and the penny dropped. Fainbos must burn. It's as simple as that. If you don't burn it, it all dies and disappears and doesn't um, survive. So, what was wrong with the Clementian succession that went over there? Remember, we saw that with the cover, it seemed to be showing the same pattern. But if we look at numbers, the Clement Clementian numbers consist of these different communities which come in and the num numbers go up um, together with the cover and they get replaced. That's not what happens in Feinbos. In Feinbos, when we have the fire, everything germinates and all the numbers are high. And from then on, the numbers continue going down and there's no species that come in later in the system. They're all there after the fire event. 
So whereas these European communities that all the scientists and stuff who came to study in Oxford and Cambridge and came to South Africa to teach us, um, they knew the system in which the plants were striving towards a climax vegetation um, in which productivity was high and everything was high. But in Feinbos, the plants are living to die. They are living and at this stage they want to burn so that this whole system can get going again. Whole fire, the whole Feinbos system is not geared towards the climax, it's geared towards the fire. This is not a catastrophe. This is a rebirth. This is a rejuvenation like Phoenix. You have to burn and become ashes and rise from the ashes. If you want to reborn, you have to die. And if you ask anyone, any botanist who wants to go in the Feinbos, and you say, we're going to certain areas, the first question they'll ask you is, how old is the felt? Because if they want orchids, they're going to come to one-year-old felt. And if they want proteas, they're not going to wait, not bother until it's at least five, six years old, and then they'll go into the felt um, that's older. So depending on what you're interested in, you'll go to different felt, age felt. And why do we need fire? Well, we don't know, but what the early botanists um, missed is that there's no recruitment between fires. There are no babies. All the babies come up after the fire. And we don't quite understand why this is. One of it is that perhaps there's too little water in summer. So after a fire, everyone germinates, you're on a grand footing. But if you try germinating in old felt, you're competing with all the old guys who are busy, who've got access to the water, and you're going to die of lack of water. Or perhaps it's a shade thing, or perhaps it's parasites and pathogens. The great thing about fire is that it wipes out all your pests, all your um, predators, all your fungi, all the hookahs that are going to eat you, they've got to come back in again. So it might just be a way of them getting rid of those. And if you try growing in old felt, the parasites and pathogens are going to get to you and chew you up. But we know that we can expect fires in Feinbos because of the fuel every 10 to 25 years, and it's going to burn. It's as simple as that. We can try keeping it out, and all we do is we create more spectacular fire. And we've got a whole set of adaptations that suggest um, of what's happening. The first is mass suicide, um, and then serotony, mimicatory, and there's a few others which we won't have time for. Okay, so the first is resprouting. This is the obvious one. All plants resprout, really. Think about your garden plants. When you prune them, you cut them back into the old wood and they all bounce back and come up refreshed and renewed. Um, and the same happens with fire. When, after fire, they all our resprouters come back refreshed and renewed. We saw them there. Some of them flower straight away. Some like the king protea take another three, four years to flower. Um, and then they produce flowers and then go back dormant. Um, but they all bounce back from the fire. And this is true of all ecosystems. Um, and here is the, or what the Americans call the war boom. Um, and this is one of the big resprouters. Now, the interesting thing about the resprouters is that they have a very low death rate. If we measure their death rate in Feinbos, it's about 1% to 5% per fire cycle. And if we do the maths, and that means that this plant is probably between 200 and 400 years old. Which means that some of these plants, ones growing on Table Mountain, were probably there looking down when Van Riebeck landed. So these are old and we can appreciate it for a bigger tree like that, but we tend to ignore it or, or overgloss it when we're talking about low shrubs like this, like the common sunshine cane bush or the euclea or the huari. These plants are also in the order of two to 400 years old um, and were probably also there when Van Riebeck came compared to those suburbs there, some of which are less than 20 years old, um, and we think we've been there forever. Um, but the thing about Feinbos um, is that only 15 to 30% of the non-bulb flora, whoopsie, sorry, of the non-bulb flora actually resprout. In other ecosystems, 90% of the plants, 99% of the plants resprout. Um, and if you think about it, if you're going to be a forest tree and something comes and nibbles you, or if a branch falls down or breaks off, you need to regrow it. Um, so you do need to resprout. But in Feinbos, 80% of the species don't even bother investing in the resources needed to recoppice or to resprout. They are killed. They are living to die. And that's what makes Feinbos so unique. It's not the resprouters which survive the fires, it's the other plants which actually die from the fire and get killed by the fire. And 
If you think about it, it has to be like that. It can't be any other way. Mass suicide is essential. We have to have a mass suicide. And it breaks down to this. If you are in ecosystem and you've got your plants growing and you want a fire and you want to have your babies survive in the post fire environment, you have got to make sure that the succession doesn't go on any further, that other plants can't come in, that other plants can't take over and move on. You've got to kill them all. And the only way you can kill all the other plants in the succession is to die yourself by burning them up. And then after the fire, you can then germinate your plants and come up in mass. So you invest all your resources in producing seeds and in producing fuel. And when the fire comes, you kill everything and your seeds are there to come up. And that doesn't work in grasslands. It doesn't work in savannas. It doesn't work in forests. It doesn't rest, work in the rest of the world. It's a Feinbos Mediterranean thing. So what we've got is this old Clemensian system where we have our disturbance going towards the climax. And if you want to engineer a fire to have a fire climax, you've got to make sure that when you burn, all these species are eliminated from the system. So you need a fire that will take you back and burn everything and stop the succession there so that you can keep your succession in the early stages of the sequence. And to do that, you need to make sure that when you burn, everything else burns with you and that nothing survives. And hence the mass suicide that's needed. Um, for fanbos. And so what's unique about fanbos is not the resprouting and surviving the fires, but all those species that burn up and make sure that nothing else survives the fire. Of course, there are nuances, and I wish I had lots more time for this talk. Um, so we've got, and let's look in the rocky areas, because rocky areas are interesting because the fire is slowed down because of the rock, because there's less fuel, and then other stuff. And so here we see some interesting strategies played out, which may be playing out there, but here fire dominates and it's much more difficult to study them or to understand them. But here we've got a slung boss, stebe, growing in this rocky outcrop. And what's interesting about stebe is it produces small little seeds and it drops them onto the ground so they lie on the ground. So if a fire comes through and it's a hot fire, those seeds will all be burnt and they'll die. So what this plant does is it retards the fire and slows down the fire. It doesn't stop the fire, but it slows it down so that it's cool. So the fire comes into a stebe patch and you have lots of smoke, um, but very little flame. And the fire moves through cool and the seed bank is maintained intact. And the other species are killed by the fire, and, but the seed allows, and we're gonna have another patch of stebe coming in there um, after the fire. But we've also got other species that are fire promoters. And here is one of the buchus, um, the Cape May, and it's in this rocky outcrop and it's full of volatile oils. And it's going to explode when the fire gets in there and it's going to carry the fire in there and create an incredibly hot fire in amongst these rocks. And it can do that because its seeds are carried underground by ants and the seeds are safely underground where they're nice and deep. And it can burn up all the buchu, all the stevie, all the slangbos um, seeds and it can make sure that the environment is perfect for its kids, which need the heat to germinate and to grow. So we've got this whole wall between those species which are trying to get the fires cooler and those that are trying to get it hotter. It's not just the passive thing of burning up. The plants are manipulating the fire. And we saw that at UCT, you don't want any of these around your buildings because they're desperate to try and get everything to burn, including your building. And it gets more involved than that. So this is our warboom again, um, and here we see it is a coppicer. It coppices from its stem. In fact, it's the only feinbos plant that actually coppices from its stem. All the other ones, if they coppice, burn down to the ground, and they coppice from their ground, from underground and bulbs, or from bulbs. Um, this is the only species that does it. And in fact, it turns out from DNA work, well, we used to think that this was the old um, primitive proteas, and that they started somewhere near tropical Africa and migrated down to the Cape and then exploded in the Cape in the spectacular diversity we see in Cape. Um, but now with the DNA work, we know that that's not true. That the species always have been in the Cape, the diversity has always been in the Cape, but the VARB worm developed this method of surviving in its epicormic buds. Um, exactly how, we're not certain. But with this innovation, this allowed it to colonize 
the savannas and grasslands. And it's only during the Ice Age from the Cape, from this lineage of epicormic reef spouters, that protists have been able to get and explode through tropical Africa and the African mountains and colonized Africa. Um, so we have this great innovation. And the problem with this is that it can't have too hot a fire. If the fire is too hot, it will destroy the branches, it will kill the epicormic bugs in here. So protein nitrogen needs a reasonably cool fire. Um, but that's not going to happen if other proteas grow around it and then take over. Um, and I mentioned before earlier, remember that fire destroys all the pathogens. Well, by surviving as epicormic bugs, protein nitrogen keeps some of its passengers. That switches broom. Um, and you can see it attacks the plants, but a, a big plant like this is not going to be affected by a little bit of witch's broom. But the competitors, the gray proteas that grow with it, and which might grow dense enough to actually burn it and kill these plants, are actually killed by that parasite when they're young and seedlings. So by keeping the parasite in these populations and infecting the neighboring plants, they keep the densities of their competitors down. Um, and so we have a whole COVID type warfare um, happening in the plants as well. It's not all passive. It's not all quiet and burning down. And we even see it on the biome level. So this is the keyboom. And if we go hiking here in the Garden Route National Park above Nature's Valley, um, you will see as you walk here that they're on the interface between the forest and the fainbos, we have these dense stands of um, keyboom. And what the keyboom does is it tries to get the fire from the fainbos into the forest and to push the forest back. And of course, the forest resists and tries not to burn down, but it's the flammability um, of the keyboom and its long lived seed banks, which can be 100, and 100 years um, in the soil, and they need heat to germinate. And that allows the fainbos to start colonizing and pushing the forest back. So it's a dynamic system. It doesn't stay the same. Some fires, will burn in, other fires, the forest will expand into the fainbos. Um, but we have a whole biome boundary determined by species that are trying to push the fires in. And you all know Virgilia would be a lovely tree in the cities, except it only lives for 15 years, it only lives for one fire cycle. So you can't plant it in the cities, it doesn't live long enough. Um, the other strategy is serotony, and this is where plants store the seeds in fire safe cones. Now, serotony is very rare. You don't get it in savannah or grasslands. There is some serotony in succulent karoo, but that's not for fire. That's storing the seeds in the plant for rain. And they only release the seeds after when it rains. Um, in serotony and fainbos, it's a matter of having fire safe cones and actually storing the seeds, not in the ground, but in the canopy of the plant um, in fire safe cones. And we can have up to six years of seeds on the plants. Um, and this occurs in the dominant species and only the dominant species. And then we'll see why in a moment. So there's our, some of our proteas. There's a leucodendron with its cones. Um, it's mainly proteas that are serotonous. We do have the San William cedar, that's also serotonous. So it also needs fire. It's also sitting there with its seeds waiting for the fire. Um, and then a few other plants um, that do that. I showed you the Erica that did it. Now the problem with serotony is that you have to be robust. So you want the fire to come through and burn everything else because you're now going to release your seeds into this post-fire environment. Um, but you need to have your seeds high enough in the canopy so that the hot fire at the ground level um, doesn't kill or cook the seeds. And then also as the fire burns, you don't want to drop these seeds into the firing mass. You've got to keep them up there. So you need to be strong enough to hold those seeds up above the fire and survive the fire at the same time as burning and killing everything else. Um, and keeping those seeds safe. And then you keep the seeds in the plant, on the plant for a week or two until all the rodents and birds have starved and have died. And then you release them in mass in huge quantities so that any rodents which did survive will be overwhelmed and your seedlings will have a chance to survive and will germinate with the next fire. Ah, sorry, not the next fire, but the next rains. So when the rains come, the seeds will germinate. So this is just a horrendogram. I'm showing the population dynamics for serotonous species. And we'll start somewhere. Let's just start at a random point over there. There's our community. And then we have a fire. And the community can either get more or less. So they can either go to less or they can go to more. And what we seem to find 
is that if we have a hot summer fire, proteas will increase and increase and increase. And every time we have a hot or a summer fire, proteas love it and will get more and more. By contrast, if we burn in spring, which is not the ideal season, or if we have a cool fire, then the proteas don't recruit so well. And the theory is that if we have a fire in summer, say fire in February or March, and the seeds are then released and they lie on the ground until the autumn rains in April. So they lie around for a month or two and then germinate. Whereas the spring fire, they released in say November and they have to sit there for November, December, January, February, March, April, and then they germinate. So they're sitting there for a long time and they get predated and they die and they blow away and they cook in the hot um, ground. Um, and so the populations tend to decline. So as a rule, populations under ideal fires increase, but we reach a stage where the proteas get so dense that they actually can't make babies. They can't make flowers. They can't make seeds. And under these conditions, even with an ideal, perfect hot summer fire, the populations will crash to very low levels. So we have this interesting dynamic. And if you come into any one place or any fire, you might be in a community that only has a couple of proteas or that is dense with proteas, it's the same community, it's the same system, it's the same environment. It's just the fire dynamics of the stages of the community and that determine whether you have lots or little proteas. And this is what makes um, Painbull so fun in that you cannot predict what the next fire is going to bring. And this fire is going to give you a protea community. The next fire will give you in the same place, an Erica community. Um, and the next fire will give you a Restio community. And because of the dynamics of the way the system is playing out with the fire. Um, now, what happens after the fire? The seeds lie on the ground. How do they know when to germinate? Well, it's simple. When it's wet and when the temperature gets cold. The cold requirement is important because otherwise they might germinate after a summer storm. And in the summer storm, they'll die of the drought. So the rare summer storms need to be catered for. So the seeds have a simple requirement that when they're wet, when the temperature drops below a temperature, and it depends from species to species and from place to place, but about nine degrees, they'll start germinating. And after a week or two, they'll start germinating and growing when it's wet. Now, the other strategy we have in Painbos is mimicacori, and this is seeds which are buried by the ants in the nest. And in the ants' nest, they are safe from predation, but the big questions are, how do they know when to germinate? And how long will they live in the seed bank? And this is just two proteas, ruri and, and, and a pincushion, um, which are two big genera which are exclusively Mimicacorus. So the Mimicacorus is quite simple. The plants produce these fruits and leucospermum means white seed. There's our white seed. And the white on the outside of the seed is the ant fruit. And the ants will come and collect the seeds. They'll actually climb up the trees, climb up the plant, sorry, catch the fruit, throw it out, and then take it straight back into their nests. And in the nest, they'll eat off the white lyosome. And then they've got a hard round nut which they can't move. So the seed is now in the nest and it's safe in the nest from predation, safe from fire, and will wait there in the nest until the fire comes and then it will germinate. And we have a whole set of species which disperse um, seeds. The bigger species bury them deeper, the smaller species bury them more shallow. And we have an alien species, the Argentinian ant, which comes through and it eats the seeds on the ground. It doesn't bury them all and then they die because the rodents eat it or the fire kills them. So Argentinian ant invaders, bad news. So we have the same um, situation with our um, Mimicacorus species um, and Therocorus, which are the ones dispersed by rodents, um, in that we have populations and they produce these large underground seed banks. Um, and if we have a cool fire, then the plants die and disappear and have gone but the seeds don't germinate. And so after the next fire, we don't have any um, plants. And this might happen a few times um, until we have a hot fire. And when we have a hot fire, they germinate. And now suddenly we have a population um, where previously there were none. We now have a nice healthy population of species of plants um, and they produce more seeds in the bank. So normally with hot fires, the population just keeps on going and they stay there. But if we have a cool fire, we can have a situation where nothing comes up. How do they know when to germinate? Well, when there's nothing on top of the soil. And what happens then is that because there's no, no plants as a blanket, the sun bakes down on the soil and heats it up during the day 
And then at night it gets cold because there's nothing to stop the heat from radiating out. So we're getting these cycles of hot and cold. Um, and what these plants do is they need a situation where they need 10 to 14 cycles of this wet and cold going below a certain temperature. So it happens in winter, so it doesn't germinate in summer. And they have to be wet. And then after 10 to 14 cycles, they will start to germinate. And that is the essence of the story. But what's missing from it is that it needs a trigger. And one of those triggers is fire. Either the heat from the fire or the smoke from the fire or the charate or the fact that the ants nests die and the pH changes. And with 2,000 species using this strategy, there's a whole host of different mechanisms of how they germinate. I'd love to have at least half an hour to tell you the story of my meaties, um, Stokoe. It's a really interesting story, but I don't. So I'll just quickly run through it. It was discovered by, Sto by Stoker. That's not Stoker who forgot where it was. It was rediscovered, but it was kept secret. Mari Foss came along and she needed a place to grow her proteas. So she grew a King Protea stand for experiments and she plied up a piece of felt, which she got permission for, and she wiped out the only known colony of my Stokoe. So that was it. Mari Foss wiped it out, it was extinct. Um, she died and it was still extinct. Um, and that was the story. So we know from the history that the last plants to have flowered and set seed were in the 1950s. Um, and that was it. When Peter Slingsby told me the story, we decided, well, why don't we actually go and burn the area again and see whether the seeds are still there in the soil and whether we can came and get them to come out. So we got forestry to burn. They were keen with the idea. They did the spectacular burn, started at nine, finished at 11, nice clean burn, perfect and nothing happened. So we concluded that the species was extinct. And then in the year 2000, a really hot fire came through and over New Year, and it burnt the area with a hot fire and voila, 37 plants came up in the middle of my fourth plot, which of course had long gone over because she'd moved on. Um, and here we are at five years, you can see half the plants have died. But the others are nice and growing and flowering and they're setting seeds and they're replenishing the seed bank. And in fact, since then, in year 2010, we had another fire and they have bounced back again, another hot fire, wildfire. Um, and that's when we realized that some of the species don't just want fire, they need hot, hot fires. Fires in the middle of the fire season, the time of the year when humans do not want fires at all because they're totally uncontrollable. Now, how long do these seeds live for? Well, we can look at this from this story and which were some seeds which were collected by Jan Tierlink in Cape Town in 1803, and he put it into his wallet. He then sailed to um, Netherlands, but because Netherlands was at war with the UK, he was captured and his packets were confiscated and were kept in the Tower of London so that they couldn't escape. And they then moved them to Chancery Lane in the National Archives, and then in 2005, Rulof van Gelder, who worked at the Millennium Seed Bank, discovered them in the archives, and they decided to germinate them, and voila, out came babies. So over 200 years stored in London, um, and the seeds were viable. So we now know that seeds live for a long time, and that there's a cache of seeds underground, so that if an unfavorable fire comes too frequently or at the wrong time of the year, um, there's a reserve of seeds that will survive the fire. And people are always talking about too frequent fires. Um, what happens when there's too many fires? Well, the answer is that we'll lose the species that need longer period of time to flower. So if we burn every two years, well, 30% of the floor is safe because they're going to cop us, they're going to re-sprout. And if we burn every five years, then half the species are going to survive. They can cope with it. And if we burn every eight years, then it's only 100 species out of 9,000, which need longer than that to survive. So too frequent fires are not the huge problem that people make out. And because as well, it changes in the landscape. So when you have lots of fire, frequent fires, um, there are patches that don't burn, and then these species survive in the patches that don't burn. So it is dynamic, it's system, and a lot of the stories about too frequent fires are overblown. Yes, it is a problem, but it's not as bad as people make out. And then Jan Flok argues that the opposite is true as well. So that 15 years is a tipping point, which is the average time. So 
So when you have frequent fires, the re-sprouters dominate the system and they grow and proliferate. But if you're allowed to go over 15 years, then the obligate long-lived species take over and they suppress and wipe out re-sprouters, which allows the other reseeders to go in and take over and to grow up and then the system is more dynamic. So how old do you allow the felt to get determines on what species are going to be there after the fire. Okay, I'm almost finished. The question is, what about the animals? That's what you all want to know, isn't it, Shirley? Well, what about the animals? The important thing to remember, there's a Facebook, is that these animals don't live for long. They don't live for 15 years. What's a Facebook lifespan? Six to 10 years? This means that this Facebook cannot learn from its mother how to survive a fire. Its survival has to be totally instinctive. It has to know what to do and know where to go and know how to survive without ever having experienced it before. Um, and anyone who doesn't know gets killed. So any species that can't cope with fire went extinct long time ago, millions of years ago. And the species we see around are those which are all adapted to fire and can cope with fire. Um, and insects, well, exactly the same. They're the same thing. Everyone knows how bees, if you put smoke, they go calm. Well, if you put smoke in the felt, they all go straight to the hive, sit in the hive and look after the hive, um, fan it if necessary, um, but go docile and calm and wait for the fire to go through before they come out again. What about the poor chameleons? They work so slowly, they can't escape. Well, um, they can move very fast when they want to. And what we think they do is that at the first whiff of smoke, they go down to the ground, find the mole holes and the mole rat holes and, and the mouse holes, and they go underground and they survive the fires underground. So even though they look like they're slow, they move it when they have to. And what about all the frogs and stuff? Well, the frogs and stuff are dormant in summer because it's hot and dry. They're underground. They don't even know about the fires. They're estivating, hibernating. Um, they're not worried about the fires. Um, the problem is when we burn after the rains, when they've come out, then we can kill them. They still get their holes to go in, but they then suffer from the fires. But during the fire season, during the summer fire season, they're dormant. They're perfectly safe. I and mean, even the birds don't breed during the fire season. So December, January, February is very low breeding season in terms of the birds in the fainbos. Um, they're not doing anything then. They start breeding with the rain. And then, of course, we have the tortoises. You're going to ask about the tortoises. And I'm afraid, repugnant as this may seem to you, tortoises are just glorified meat buyers. They have chosen for when the fire comes to burn. Just like the plants, they're going to die. Um, and what they do is that in spring, before the fire season, they will lay the eggs, one or two eggs, on the ground, and the fire comes through and the adults get killed. And then in autumn, after the rains, the eggs hatch, and we've got our population restored, um, and the system continues as normal. Um, so if you're going to go and rescue tortoises, please don't bring them back. Because after the fire, the population will have restored itself. If you bring back the tortoises and release them there, you're going to be bringing in the diseases, you're going to be bringing in competition, and the poor babies won't survive. You'll be killing them by bringing in competition. So yes, if you're going to rescue tortoises, you need to give them away as pets or look after them in some other way. Okay, I'm almost finished. I've just got to say here that if you think I've presented a coherent picture and that I know a lot, I'm afraid I don't. We know nothing. We've only just begun to scratch the surface. In 100 years' time, some botanist is going to sit over here and quote me and quote what I've just said and say how wrong I was. I and mean, here's just an example. Um, 2016, this restio has been found to dupe this dung beetle to bury its seeds so it'll be safe from the fire. And how does it do it? By pretending to be a pontebok drop. So, there's your Pontebok poop, and there is your dung beetle going and burying it. And only after he's buried it does he discover or she discover, no, that's not a Pontebok troll. That is a seed, and the seed is safe underground waiting for the fire. So there's lots we don't know. A quarter of our vestiaires we can germinate because they're spectacular plants. They're grown horticulturally. The other ones we don't know how to germinate. They come up after fire, but in the nursery we can't get the seeds to germinate. So there's lots we don't know. We've only scratched the surface. And I'm going to stop with a quote by Sir David Hutchins. Um, he was made a sir. You'll see why in a moment. Um, and he's 
from 1893, before our botanist got going. He was the British forester and he worked in the Cape and in the Highfelt. And he said, great misapprehension prevails on the subject of fire, caused mainly by looking at it from the point of view of an inhabitant of Northern Europe. The felt fire here is not an incendiary disaster, but a natural process that usually is only dangerous when ignorantly interrupted or for some reason or other too long deferred. So we've known about how to manage fires for a long time. Every generation seems to try and reinvent the wheel um, and do it differently. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to thank Mike for allowing me to use the pictures from the Caper Flame. Um, unfortunately, the book is not available, but Mike assures me that for the 2030 fire, he is ready um, and they will have a book out. And again, they will use the proceeds from the book to support the groups involved with Table Mountain, including the honorary rangers. And here are the links I told you about in Natasha and William Bond's video. Um, and yeah, please go look at William, William's video. And um, I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm quite willing to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> well, Tony, um, you certainly changed my uh, view on fires in Feinbos. Uh, you know, we, like you quite rightly said, uh, we always thought that uh, fires are, are bad because it damages uh, property, but it is obviously very selfish of us only to think about uh, our, own, our own property. Uh, it's clear to me that there's a very fine balance between the three variables you mentioned, um, the ignition and the O2 and, and, and climate and, um, and, uh, and the fuel. And uh, it seems to me that the less we interfere, the better it is for the, uh, for the environment. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Tony, for not only sharing your expertise with us, but also your passion. It's clear that, uh, that you are passionate about what you do. And not only that, you're modest as well, because we know that you are good and you're an expert in your field. Uh, and it, it comes with many years of research and many years of observation about uh, what's going on around you. So uh, thank you very much for the great work you've done. Um, I'm going to, uh, your, your presentation was so thorough that there are very few questions, but there are uh, some very interesting remarks. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Thanks, Tori, very interesting. Thank you, excellent and informative. Uh, thumbs up, and everybody is in awe about, uh, about um, your presentation, Tony. Uh, there are two questions, however, that I think we can share. You may have answered some of the some of the uh, aspects of these questions already, but I'm going to pose it to you anyway. Um, the first one is when you say, without fire, Feinbos dies, but does it actually die or does it just go dormant until the next fire happens? And how long can it remain, remain dormant as uh, seed or tubers? Okay, so there's um, several questions there. The, the first one is the actual plants. Um, and we've seen that we've got the fire weeds that come in and die out straight away. And especially genera like Aspalathus, which is the Cape Gorse. And they, being peas, and they make their seeds and they disappear very quickly. If they hang around too long, they'll get eaten. So they quickly make seeds and disappear. So there are those species which come in and die straight away. But then you've got your long-lived species. And they do tend to hang around for quite a while. But at the same time, the felt's getting older and there's more dead fuel and more um, dead litter lying around, which doesn't decompose because of the hot summers. Um, so it's sitting around there and waiting. And yeah, really, the feinbos just slows down and dies. Um, so all the above ground, all the shrubs in them die um, and you end up with um, fuel ready to burn. If you're nearby a forest or nearby the strandfelt, then the forest species do invade. And then you tend to have a succession moving on but then with the next fire, they get killed. But we don't know what's happening with the bulbs. That is a big question. Um, and you'll see these species that come up, they flower off the fire and then they go dormant. You can't even find the leaves. And there's no way that the bulb can stay dormant without any leaves for 15, 20, 30 years. Um, 
So they're doing something we still don't understand exactly what it is and how they're doing it. But they're ticking over and waiting for the fire. So there's a whole set of strategies. Um, and yeah, I, I guess there's no answer to the question because the answer is all of the above. All of the, all of the things you can imagine they could do, they're doing, and then a whole lot you can't imagine as well. Um, so, um, and they have to stay dormant for that entire period. If the fire takes 40 years to come back, they've still got to be there after the 40 years. Um, and a lot of them do. Um, you'll have an orchid coming back which wasn't seen for 40 years, and voila, there it is um, after the next fire. So yeah, now they, they come back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony. Then the next question is, uh, um, uh, when you say that Kierboom tries to push the fire from the Feinbos into the forest, uh, surely this is a plant which does not make cognitive decisions, etc. Uh, I get what you're saying, but it's about survival as opposed to conscious decisions. How does this actually happen? These okay, so now I I've anthropomorphized it. I've explained it as, um, as what, as as someone trying to make a decision, but that's not how it works. Um, the way it works is that um, this is a plant which um, burns, burns hot. It burns on the forest edge, and its environment, it's a niche, is there right on the forest edge. So it's adapted to fire, and when the fires come, it burns hot, and it pushes the forest um, backwards. So it's not a cognitive decision, but it's a strategy. Um, and the, the thing about evolutionary strategies is that one can make them and one can anthropomorphize them and explain them, but that's purely for illustrative purposes. They're not thinking, they're not planning, they're not doing it that way. They've just got that niche and it works. Um, and they survive in that niche. Um, so, yeah. Um, Thanks. So, Thanks. Yeah, just, yeah, please excuse my license with that, but it makes for a far more interesting story no. than if I told it boringly. Yeah, no, it makes it makes perfect sense. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. And um, uh, last question: uh, we we we've read on many occasions that plants communicate with e with each other. Does this happen in fungus as well? Do you know of any research in that regard? There's no studies looking at um, plant communication in fungus with one another. Um, certainly, they have mycorrhizae, so they've got fungal um, roots. Um, some of them, some of them don't, um, and they've got extensive roots. But whether they communicate with one another, we don't know. It, it's unlikely that they don't. The question is how much, and it also depends on what you mean by communicate. So, for instance, the classical case would be um, a, an acacia tree that gets browsed by a kudu, and then it releases chemicals into the air which warn other trees that there's a kudu eating. Um, that is a communication. It's not a it's not a discussion, it's not a story, but it's a warning that's put out in terms of chemicals. And I'm sure Fainless plants do the same. Um, and I'm sure they do it for a lot of reasons, including when they're getting predated or when they get diseased, um, they'll be communicating with one another as well. Tony, thank you very much. And once again, thank you for, your, for the good work that you are doing uh, and, uh, and your institution at Sanby. Uh, thank you for your time, and thank you, uh, Prof, for sharing your expertise with us. It's always a pleasure listening to you, and we would like to wish you best of luck with your endeavors in future. Thanks, Tony. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And if you have any more questions, yeah, please feel free to email me or contact me, and um, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that, Tony. I just would like to share with our participants our upcoming webinars. Uh, on, the 8th of, uh, on the 8th of September, we will have Hugh Stevens um, that I'm sure needs no introduction to our uh, SHR members. Uh, and he's going to share with us his reflections on a career in national parks. Now, those of you that, uh, that don't know Joop that well, Joop started off in uh, Kruger National Park as a, as a branch manager of the, of the APSA bank in Skukuza. And when uh, APSA wanted to uh, transfer him up the corporate ladder uh, back to uh, Johannesburg, he, ref he refused and he applied for a position in Sandparks. And he started working for Sandparks in, uh, in, 19, um, in 1990. Um, 
in Kruger National Park. So he is going to share with us 30 years uh, of his career uh, in Sandbox. And the mere fact that he worked with five CEOs, under five CEOs in his uh, career time, uh, I think will make, uh, will make for some very interesting, uh, interesting talk. So please join us on the 8th of September for you. And then on the 22nd of September, we will uh, have Dr. Machil Mo uh, talking to us on a book uh, that he was the co-author of. Uh, the book is about the heart and soul of the Tangkwa Karur. And he's, they're going to take us through a journey and share with us all the research uh, they have done. So if you look at the authors of this book, uh, you, I, I think you will agree with me. You know, you sit with a with a doctor with a PhD in um, as a librarian. You sit with a doctor, uh, Rina Stein, as a um, with a PhD uh, as a, as a drama specialist, and you sit with the third author, which is Michiel's wife Beverly. She's a museologist. Uh, she, she's got an M in in uh, in music, and uh, and I think you will agree as a team, uh, they were creative. I know them well. They were meticulous in their research. They were very analytical, and with a drama specialist and musician in your midst, uh, I think very entertaining as well. So uh, Michiel is going to share with us. Uh, the book and the research that went into into it it will be uh, it will be on the on the shelves shortly and we're going to look forward to Michiel's talk on the 22nd of, of September so with that uh, I'm going to also um, say goodbye to to all of you um, I would like to once again thank all our HRs for for joining us uh, on these webinars, and specifically the one uh, that uh, Professor Tony Rebello gave us tonight. And of course, as you know, maybe there are someone watching uh, with you that uh, are not in HR that would like to make a donation. So you're more than welcome to, to scan uh, our little hohaiki um, there on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, a snap scan and and make a donation towards a very uh, a very good course. Thank you very much, everybody, and stay well, stay safe. Until next time, bye bye.